I'm going to make a start. I know there's lots of people still joining us, but we've got a very tight schedule. So we want to try and, in, in the format of um, citizens, try and keep as much to time. Um, so yeah, my name's Salma Rava. I'm one of your co-chairs today. I'm from Leicester Citizens and I work for a homelessness charity. Um, community organizing, organizing matters to me because it gives me hope that this work that we're doing here in Leicester to address homelessness um, is helping to build power and hopefully tackle the root causes of social injustice like homeless, homelessness. I'm joined by my lovely co-chair Francis who's going to now introduce himself. Francis? Thank you. It's great to be co-chairing this meeting. My name is Francis obviously and I'm a year 11 student at All Saints uh, Catholic School in Barking and Dagenham in East London. I first got involved in community organising about two years ago through the school council and I'm truly proud to be with you at this event which is all about sharing our learning across citizens alliances and with partner organisations. We have an amazing group of people here, over 120 people. We will break into groups twice for discussion but we don't have time for everyone to introduce themselves sadly um, so please continue to put your names and your organizations in the chat. I'm sure everyone loves to know who you are and loves to see what kind of people we have in Citizens UK. We have a packed agenda with lots of speakers, so we will make sure that we end on time. And that means all of our speakers need to stick to the, um, need to stick to the, to, to the time allotted. It needs to, if, if needs be, we will have to interrupt you, sadly. Nothing personal, but we have to respect everyone's time. To start off, I'd like to invite Matthew Bolton, the Executive Director of Citizens UK, and then Dawn Austick, the Chief Executive of the National Lottery Community Fund, to give their opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Salma and uh, Francis. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, thanks to the National Lottery Community Fund for partnering uh, on this event. Uh, it's fantastic to have this group here and just also want to say sorry if the time uh, mix up has inconvenienced anyone. I wish we could blame Zoom or the clocks changing, but it was just a human error uh, here. Uh, particularly thanks for coming uh, with everything going on. These are really tough times uh, with you know upheaval and worry uh, in our personal lives and work lives uh, is tough, but there is plenty of cause uh, for hope. And one of the causes for hope is the way that communities have responded. Um, and this pandemic has really demonstrated how important the local uh, fabric of relationships is in providing that network of, um, of support and civic action. And now as we enter what will be the second um, lockdown, uh, you know, the feeling of uh, we're all in this together is under more pressure, more risk of uh, fracture. And so the strength of those relationships, you know, within communities, between communities will be all the more uh, important. So the question of how to actually weave those relationships um, together is of real relevance uh, right now. Uh, but it's also part of a wider um, paradigm shift, really, where we are recognising that it just doesn't work um, to do things to people. And for social change to stick, uh, we need to build people power, uh, local ownership, people's agency. And it's a good point to underline how important we see the community funds shift to uh, people in the lead uh, ethos um, as a kind of driver of that wider, um, of that wider paradigm shift. And, and Citizens UK is probably best known for its bigger campaigns, the Living Wage or Refugee Welcome. But underneath that uh, is patient, local work, stitching together relationships, building trust, building leadership. And that's really the people power base uh, that underpins all of the local and national kind of projects and campaigns. And this evaluation uh, is the first in-depth analysis into that local organizing. Uh, it focuses on our efforts to build new alliances in 10 new places around England. I wanna thank uh, Jason uh, Panju Wood, who we'll hear a lot from for leading on the evaluation and Daphne here for a lot of hard work to make it happen. Uh, I wanna recognize the, um, the local leaders and organizers who've now built sustainable, diverse alliances in eight of those uh, areas and the great legacy of social change uh, for years to come, but also a legacy of, of insights into how we weave that 
uh, fabric, how we build community power that we hope will be useful uh, for the wider sector. So this work and this evaluation was funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. And I wanna thank Dawn in particular for her uh, support and leadership. Uh, and I'll pass over to Dawn uh, now. Dawn, if you're here. I am indeed. Good morning. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you very much for having me. Um, Reweaving the Fabric of Society. I thought that was such a great title. Um, and so timely in these days of profound challenge and change. Um, I'm really delighted to be here this morning uh, to explore the learning that's emerging from the community organising growth projects that Citizens UK have been developing across England. As Matthew said, our um, strategy is literally called People in the Lead. Um, so this is very close to our hearts. And I think um, during the pandemic and the crisis, we've seen extraordinary efforts by neighbours, <clears throat> by communities, charities, or society to pull together to support and also to innovate. Um, and it's been inspiring and moving in amongst um, the sort of extraordinary difficulties that we've all faced. Uh, and I was really interested that the More Together report that came out, I think it was last week, which looked at um, responses across Europe, the UK um, citizens felt that the pandemic had increased positive um, community commitments and feelings uh, more than any other nation. I thought that was something really um, important for us to build on. But I think we do recognise that that is variable, um, that in some places there are breakdowns of trusts, relationships aren't strong, and sometimes there isn't capacity um, to respond in, in the way that there is in others. And sometimes there just hasn't been practice. So from our point of view, a kind of really key question is what, what are the sort of conditions precedent for success and how can they be created? So today's meeting discussion and this um, evaluation really offers some important insights into this question. Um, on a sort of, uh, as a funder um, for charities, local government, everyone interested in place-based community power. Um, this is really important territory for us all so we can learn, we can share the best of practice um, and we can also learn from what I would call those oopsie moments when we don't quite get things right but sometimes you learn more from those than from the things that go very, very smoothly. Um, so I'm really excited about the insights, how do we build trust across different communities, what really works in building local ownership, and how, how do we collectively become more than the sum of our individual parts. And I think this model offers us some great clues about how we do that, rejecting some of those sort of more traditional leadership models in favour of a leader who is someone with a following, not necessarily someone with position power, um, right through to how to bring groups together to create organised money at a, at a very kind of local and micro level. Uh, and often actually not very much money can make a significant difference. And that's something that's really interesting to us with our small grants programme, Awards for All. So um, we're interested in this topic, in, in, in this evaluation, in this approach. But um, as a funder with a deep commitment to putting people in the lead, we're not doctrinaire about methodologies when it comes to community organising. Sorry, Matthew. Um, we're, we're interested in what works, what works in different places, what works in different contexts uh, and what works with different people. So this model, alongside more kind of what you might call technocratic models of place-based collaboration, like collective impact, which has been championed much more in the US than here, I think, or community asset approaches like ABCD, they all add to our collective ability to be part of connected and powerful communities. So I'd, I'd like to say thank you all for coming. I hope you have a really interesting um, early part of your Monday morning. Um, personally, um, it's a great way to start the week. So uh, I would, with no more ado, I will hand back to, I'm not quite sure who I'm handing back to, but I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Dawn. Now, we'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jason Pandya Wood, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia, and whom we are privileged to have as our academic partner, leading on the robust evaluation of our community organizing work in 10 new areas. Thank you, co-chairs, and uh, from here, it's good evening. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today. I'm so pleased to be able to uh, share some insights from the first of our reports from the Citizens UK Growth Projects Evaluation. 
Why is this work important? Well, obviously, we very much hope that the learning from this will help Citizens UK to continue its own growth and development. But beyond that, this work has significance for all those interested in how we genuinely put people in the lead and build community power and ownership. So for around about the past two decades, I've been involved in researching and teaching this subject area. The theory is always good, but the practice varies considerably. We've seen lots of initiatives come and go with varying degrees of success. We also know that whilst the method of organizing used by Citizens UK has been developed here for over 30 years, the academic research into its impact has been lacking. Indeed, this is one of the UK's first evaluation projects of its kind. The Citizens UK growth projects have given us an insight into how organizing develops in diverse locations, what is needed to make it a success and how it can impact upon the lives of individuals, communities and wider society. The lessons we can learn from this work are even more vital in times of crisis, as we've already heard. So today our focus is on three themes that we explore in the first of our evaluation reports. These are building relationships and acting together, building genuine ownership and developing leaders. So to our first theme, communities are stronger when there are ties and resources that bind them. They are healthy when they have thriving civil society institutions, when people trust one another and are strengthened by relationships with diversity. Organized communities depend on relationships internally between civil society institutions and with those who hold the power to make the change. The Citizens Alliances have led to significant gains for institutions in all three of these aspects. For example, 90% of survey respondents stated that their member institution is better at building relationships within and beyond the institution. 82% stated that their member institution is better at connecting people from within to people of different backgrounds from outside of the institution. Member institutions are more influential with evidence that they've been able to gain commitments or change from a wide range of key decision makers. For example, council leaders, mayors, local authority portfolio holders, NHS leaders, and police and crime commissioners. And campaigns on issues have demonstrated the breadth of concern for local areas, improvements to mental health services, night shelters for the homeless, leading a national campaign to improve the experiences of children in receipt of free school meals, all off examples. 71% of our participants felt that their campaigns had achieved what they set out to achieve to some extent, and 18% felt that it had achieved everything. People's concerns and the issues closest to their lives have shaped local agendas on a significant scale. This in turn has strengthened relationships within and between civil society institutions. Listening has been crucial in this regard. In Essex, for example, over a thousand people were listened to in the run-up to the planned police, fire and crime commissioner elections. And COVID-19 has not halted this activity. In July 2020, Somerset Citizens held its accountability assembly online with a turnout of nearly 100 people. Back to you, Francis. Thank you. It's fantastic to hear these insights from the research to bring it all to life, we will now hear from two community leaders in two new citizens alliances. Welcome Pastor Cecilia. How did your community build relationships and act with others? Thank you, thank you. Hello, I'm Pastor Cecilia and I lead the Pentecostal Church based in Marksgate, one of the major estates in the London borough of Barking and Dagenham. I'm also the co-chair of our citizens leadership team our Citizens Alliance is made up of schools, faith groups, and resident associations, all paying membership dues. There's a big population chain in, in the bar with families moving in and out. And this, is, this makes it difficult to build a sense of place and neighborliness. So when an, I and other community leaders started thinking about how a new Citizens Alliance could benefit, we realized that we'd have to come together and do something impactful. Join the meeting connecting different schools. So we partnered with, with joined, we partnered with the local Anglican church around the corner from us. We built a team of people because what we did we realized that in, in the, on the stage, there were portals on one of the main roads. 
So we decided to do an action based on that. We decided to start with something small and tangible so that many people in our, because our people in our area had felt they'd never been listened to and they were a little skeptical when we began. To our surprise, the council responded very quickly to our campaign and completed the repairs to the tune of a quarter of a million pounds. This both boosted our confidence. Clearly, we realized if we act coll collectively, we can be powerful and win change. We also, as a congregation, have been holding annual community festivals on the estate. Uh, and we working with it, it, we adopted a block of flats there. But uh, so we, we used to do the festivals only, but then we did more, we started doing football outreach when a 15 year old was tragically stabbed and killed on the estate. So we started a hugely successful football club uh, with the aim of actually reaching out to the young people and getting them off the street. We partnered with Dakas Football Club and the borough. Then when the pandemic hit, we worked with other members of Barking and Dagenham citizens to secure funding that has enabled us to give out food vouchers to families on the estates. Now that we are expect, accepted and valued by the Maxgate community, we are planning to hire a youth worker so that we can deepen our relationship on the estate and involve more people in community organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Cecilia. May I ask Trish from Citizen Somerset to now share her perspective on how we can bridge divisions and find common ground through our broad-based community alliances. Trish, can you hear us? Are you there? Let's just maybe wait um, for one more moment to see if Trish can hear us and if she can share her story. Um, it looks like she can't, Francis. Uh, could we carry on and then perhaps bring her in later? Um, <clears throat> it, okay, so as we can't hear from Trish right now, we're going to have to skip ahead slightly. So can we now have uh, Citizens UK director, Jonathan Cox, who will share a brief reflection about the way in which relationships form the basis of people power. Thanks Francis. We're often told that the social fabric of our communities is fraying. So what does it mean for Citizens UK to use the metaphor of reweaving the social fabric of communities? Well, firstly, the metaphor assumes that we're better woven together than as individual threads, that we are social beings who belong in community. Lives, despite our differences, are enriched by those around us and with whom our future flourishing is enmeshed. The recent Britain's Choice Report from More in Common, which Dawn alluded to in her introduction, states that people in Britain are not as deeply divided as is often assumed. What we find consistently in the research is that when people focus on the fault lines, it often obscures the common ground. As Joe Cox MP said, we have far more in common than divides us. And that's certainly our experience in community organizing. Secondly, the metaphor requires us to understand a bit about weaving. And I think Daphne's gonna show some slides here. Fabric is made through the process of repeatedly weaving the weft, which is a piece of thread, horizontally across the warp, a row of vertical threads. At a community level, the warp, that row of firm upright threads, represents local civil society institutions, such as schools, mosques, union branches, synagogues, universities, residents associations, community centers, those anchor institutions with deep roots in our communities but also newer organizations like LGBT support groups, refugee community sponsorship groups, and even most recently a gym. Whichever institutions command the trust and participation of people in that place. Community organizing creates the weft between the warp of existing local groups, enabling them to understand one another and identify what they have in common through one-to-one -one meetings, community leadership training, local campaign actions and accountability assemblies, 
Community organizing teaches people to become weavers of the social fabric in their own communities. Now, Jason's evaluation shows what this can achieve, whether that's uh, women-only swimming sessions in Colchester or fairer bus fares in Somerset or the potholes getting fixed, um, as Cecilia was telling us in Bar. But many communities across the UK have really struggled during the pandemic as traditional service, charity and advocacy models have faced some limitations. The relational model used by Citizens UK has been resilient though. In the three months from July to September, over 1600 people had their weaving skills developed through Citizens UK, with over 7,000 people in those communities benefiting tangibly from action that they took, whether that's through higher wages, better support, or a more responsive state. This success is down to the trust woven between community leaders prior to the pandemic. The More in Common report identifies the local community as the best place to build the kind of relationships that enable people to work with those who are different to them and to build the power for change. But this won't happen unless we can recruit, train and mentor many thousands more weavers like Cecilia in the painstaking work of strength, strengthening the warp and the weft of their own communities. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing those insights. Um, Daphne, have we got Trish with us? Um, and is she able to share her story? I think. Right. I Trish, if you're with us, please do unmute yourself and share your story. Oh. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Yeah, sorry, I'm on my phone. Uh, hello, I'm Trish, and I co lead the Citizen Somerset Action Team on Public Transport. This is an issue that has brought together many different people in our community, from students to the elderly and those with disabilities, those who live in Taunton and those who live in the rural areas. When the schools and faith groups that make up Citizen Somerset launched their listening campaigns, we realized that we were all impacted by the expensive and unreliable bus network that serves our area. Five schools got their students involved because so many of them struggled to afford the county bus ticket, which they need to get from the rural village they live in into town for college. Bus fares in Somerset are much higher than in other regions. In fact, in many places, students get to travel for free on public transport. Even when subsidised, an annual ticket costs over £700 per student. And on top of this, many students don't qualify for the subsidy so it costs them double. But it isn't just about cost. There are very few buses and they are often overcrowded. This has now become worse due to social distancing. Many of us have had to wait for hours to get a place on a bus and make our way home from work, from college or from the hospital. This issue of public transport gets right to the heart of the biggest problems facing us in Somerset. While there are wealthy parts, there are many parts which are very isolated and deprived of economic opportunities. Reliable, accessible and affordable buses are crucial then. It makes me sad to see so many young people feel that they have no option but to get a driver's license. This is also an environmental issue. So you can imagine how excited all of Citizen Somerset were to take public action in April this year. Over a hundred of us planned to march down the main road towards the County Council, carrying a big cardboard bus and singing wheels on the bus. This wasn't possible when we entered lockdown, but I'm proud that we were able to adapt to the circumstances. We held, we held a large online assembly and negotiated on Zoom with the leader of the County Council and the head of First Bus Southwest. And we received a commitment from them that they will work with us to find a solution, make the bus fares system fairer and improve the frequency of buses serving rural villages. Community organising has given us a means to work closely and become more powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, and thank you everyone for your um, contribution so far and your insights. Um, now to keep the energy up and a chance to process what we've been talking about, um, we're going to be having a breakout session now. Um, you're going to be in a breakout session with three others. 
um, and hopefully you'll all get a chance to speak. You'll all have two minutes to speak. Um, and just tell us, you know, what struck you so far? What, what's been interesting for you? Um, just before we start, I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to think about one thing that struck you so far, um, and then we'll be going into the breakout room. So your 30 seconds starts now. Back, I think people are coming back now. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so thank you for uh, taking part in the breakout room. Um, so, so far we've talked about relationships and collective action, but community organising also teaches us that you've got to be coupled with genuine ownership of local leaders. Um, so we're going to move on to our next uh, theme, the second theme of today, and I'm really pleased to introduce my friend, Reverend Karen Rooms, who has founded not just one, but two alliances, including ours here in Leicester. So over to our Chair of Trustees at Citizens Use UK, uh, Reverend Karen Rooms. Thank you, Salma. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen, uh, and as Salma has said, I'm Citizens UK's Chair, Chair of Trustees and was a founding chair in Nottingham and a leader in Leicester. So, but for seven years, I was a parish priest in St Anne's, which is a deprived ward on the edge of Nottingham city centre. Now, St Anne's was absolutely consulted to death and it was a magnet for projects. And the leader of the city council was our ward councillor. So we were the ward of good practice. But people were weary of dispatches telling their stories of being the sexy postcode and giving their views on things when the real decisions were already being made elsewhere. So people were so wary of the well-meaning and their agendas, including the church, and it took time to build trust. But organising is different. We organise around our own agendas. And in Nottingham, we were told, if you want to change, you need power and you need to pay for it. So if we wanted that change, we had to take responsibility for it and not just assume other people are going to do it. So we knew that from day one, our institutions and our communities needed to own our own alliance and agenda, and we needed to pay for it. So if we had to depend on the local authority or local business social responsibility grants, we were never going to be able to hold them to account for low wages and the policies and practice, practices in our communities that we wanted to change. So paying for our organizer, we had the power to decide our own priorities. And it's this distinctive that lies at the heart of Citizens UK's model of change. But it's really hard to do it, to persuade local organisations in deprived areas to spend money on leadership development and social change. So the church, the mosque, the school, even the small voluntary sector organisation have to pay something. But whether it's university paying 25,000 or a refugee association paying 100 pounds, each of them has an equal vote when it comes to our delegates assemblies and setting the campaign priorities. And that's really important. So we're here today with a fantastic evaluation of investment from the National Lottery Community Fund. That investment was the upfront catalyst for eight new alliances, including ours in Leicester. We do need trusts and foundations to support the work and we're grateful for those that do. Our chapters are 50 to 65% funded by membership dues. So it's a mixed income model. And we hope that this evaluation encourages others to co-invest with us. So in Leicester with all the will in the world, Keith and other Church of England priests and I didn't have the time to move things forward. We'd both worked in Nottingham and seen communities win the change they wanted. We wanted it to happen in Leicester but Leicester citizens only got started because of the two year grant fund uh, that funded and paid for one day a fortnight of supervision of Daniel being our development organizer. Having that other person who held us to account for what we were doing made all the difference. So we developed a solid base of other leaders to organize people and to organize our money. We wanted that local Jews base to make our alliance sustainable. So two years have come and gone. We were up and running. We had two have two significant strategic partners and 15 Jews paying members from different communities. And we employ not only one, but two part-time organizers. So one of the most exciting things for me is the work we're doing around mental health in schools, which came out of our first listening process. And we are just delighted that it's all been possible and happened. So thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that great reminder. 
putting people in the lead means that we must build genuine people power. And to do this, people need the money, uh, need to own the money and also own their agenda. Uh, the next story is very special. We've got Val Barron from Sunderland Citizens, who is going to tell, it, tell us about the listening process, which is so crucial as part of the community or organising. And it makes, us, um, makes it possible for us to identify the issues that really matter to the people on the ground. Over to you, Val. Good morning. Yeah, I'm a community development practitioner in Durham Diocese, and I work in some of the most economically deprived communities in the Northeast. And like um, was just said, these are very done to communities. Six years ago, I was helping set up a holiday hunger activity in Easington Colliery near Sunderland. And I asked them about their community. They come here, they do stuff to us, and then they leave, was what I was told. And I've always remembered that. It was a sticking plaster response that failed to engage or in, empower local people. And that's why I'm so passionate about now being a community organizer. I've been involved in the same issue, child poverty, which is one of our diocesan strategies. But this time I'm starting with the lived experience of young people and empowering them to make the changes. Pupils in Sunderland spoke to, out about the fact that they couldn't access or carry over their unused school dinner change, leaving them feeling stigmatised and hungry. Let's hear directly from the students of the Venerable Bede Academy in Sunderland. Police take money from you, so why would you allow a big corporation? Did you know that in some schools, people on free school meals, if they don't spend all their money, the change get taken to big brand companies as profit? This is unfair, and you can help make a difference. Are you with us? Through community organising, it was a bit of the film that they made, through community organising, the students were able to engage in a cycle of action, starting with listening and research, followed by public action and negotiation. They built a team, they requested a meeting with their head teacher to make him aware of the problem and urged him to fix the IT problem so that their money stayed in their accounts and could be rolled over. Not only did they get their school on board, they went on to lead an investigation with other schools in the region that hit national news headlines and revealed that about 65 million pounds is lost each year, affecting about a quarter of a million pupils. So when we speak about genu genuine leader ownership, we really do mean it. We don't go into our schools or our communities with a predetermined set of assumptions of what matters to them. The process of organising is as important as the outcomes. As Jill Booth, the head teacher of the Day Springs Multi Academy Trust, comments, she says the project has raised people's <coughs> self esteem and removed an invisible barrier for our young people's lives. It also has a direct impact on school leaders across the trust, and we have continued to develop the way we use pupil voices as a result. At a time when we face huge social injustice, community organising can assure the agenda and agency sits with our amazing young people during a time when their voices have been very absent. Thank you. Thank you, Val. What an inspiring example of bottom-up campaigning. However, before we make the mistake of assuming that local ownership among community leaders stops us from achieving impact on a bigger scale, we're now going to hear from Martha Crawford from the Living Wage Foundation. Hi everyone, I'm Martha Crawford. I'm the Head of Business Development for the Living Wage Foundation and I also work a day a week as the Development Organiser um, for Oxford Citizens. So the Living Wage movement started locally 20 years ago 
wasn't developed by a think tank or a policy body, but by community leaders pushing anchor institutions, uh, anchor employers in East London to pay people more money. And today that movement means that there are nearly 7,000 accredited living wage employers paying the real living wage, which is rooted in the cost of living to those that they directly employ and indirectly employ through their supply chains. And that means next week, when it's um, during living wage week, when the living wage will go up, a quarter of a million people will get a pay rise. And the success of the living wage campaign is down to genuine local leadership from the start and continued ownership. We continue to work and support local chapters where low pay is one of their priority campaigns and has come up as a local issue. And some of our greatest living wage wins have been due to local campaigns. From the very start with big organizations like HSBC to over the last two years, anchors like anchor employers like City Airport in East London and Sunderland City Council and others accrediting because of the work of living wage action teams, many of whom are on the call today, giving hundreds of workers a much needed pay rise. Uh, next week there is Living Wage Week, as I mentioned, and there'll be several announcements of new living wage employers joining the movement as a direct result of the campaigning by Citizens Alliances. Um, and this is why the campaign has stood the test of time and is a resilient movement. Despite worries about you know, work, the world of work at the moment because of the pandemic, since the pandemic started, we've welcomed nearly 800 new living wage employers to the movement, which has led to pay rises for over 20,000 people, including over 8,000 key workers. It was important enough to people to take action and strategize around back then and that remains true today and that is why the movement is the success that it is. Thank you Martha for this key perspective. We've heard about the importance of diverse relationships, collective action and genuine ownership but what underpins all of this is our focus on developing a wide range of community leaders. Jason, can you tell us more about more on this? Yeah, thanks, Francis. Uh, leadership development is central to the success of community organising. And through their engagement with community organising, you see lots of development go on for individuals, for communities, and so on. Over half of those who've been invo become involved with the alliances had lived experiences of the issues they were campaigning on. Through their engagement with training, 89% felt that they were more equipped community leader, and 83% believed they were more equipped to achieve social change. The real hands-on experience comes with sitting on leadership groups, leading action teams and campaigns, and organising some of the most high-profile public actions. Uh, as a result, 45% felt that they were more capable of making decisions about things in their personal, mm -hmm. professional and public life. Yeah. I always get unnerved when that happens. 81% <laughs> had developed skills in taking effective public action on issues that mattered to them. 79% were better at building or strengthening relationships and 78% could better negotiate with those in power. Their engagement also contributed interestingly to the development of broader civic responsibilities. For example, 25% for the first time urged someone outside of their family to vote. 31% uh, presented their views to a council or MP, 32% led or joined a campaign about an issue they care about, 9% voted in the general election for the first time, 10% in the local election, and one person stood for public office. Now, the development for individuals is often multi-layered, as this participant tells us. Citizens has changed my life. I felt I had to hide my experience if I wanted to be a good leader. Citizens has taught me that I can be my authentic self and that my lived experiences have shaped who I am. I understand that these experiences actually make me a better leader. And I know that wherever I am, I can build community and bring people together over shared values. We've seen leadership development in three different categories. We've got new leaders, people who never thought of themselves as leaders before, never had recognition, or had previously never had the experience to lead. Emerging leaders, those who are within member institutions through their engagement with community organizing, are able to accelerate their own leadership trajectory. And then the third group are established leaders doing things differently, 
These are people who, through their engagement with citizens, change the ways in which they lead their institutional sector. They'll organize differently, lead campaigns, or develop others in different ways. And I'm hoping we're joined now by leaders who might fit into each of those categories. Sorry, Francis, you'll have to unmute. Oh, my apologies. Thank you, Jason. Can I invite Fiona from Sunderland Citizens to share her experience of developing as a new leader? Fiona is a therapeutic enabler at the Recovery College in Newcastle. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, I began my journey as a community leader in early 2019 when I attended a training session in community organising through Rococo, the Recovery College, where at the time I was enrolled as a student. I was experiencing a low point in my life, waiting to be dismissed from my job because of my mental health difficulties. Not only that, I'd been sent from pillar to post whenever I tried to access support services through the NHS, and I felt like I was slipping through the cracks and was angry. My facilitator at college was a tiny and weird leader in tiny and weird citizens who were campaigning on mental health issues, so she encouraged me to attend the training and channel my anger in a positive direction. At first, with all the talk about leadership, it made me think, this is not for me. I'm a soldier. I can do the footwork, but I'm not a leader. But at one point, the penny dropped. I was told anyone can be a leader, provided they have followers. I realised that there were people I had strong relationships with in the college. My perspective changed and my confidence grew. I got others in the college involved in our mental health campaigns and public assemblies, which saw the candidates for regional mayor, as well as NHS commissioners and many others being held to account. I also took the initiative of chairing our service user support group within the college, implementing all the tools that I'd learned about how to build an effective team and lead meetings. Soon the college began to perceive us differently and we were able to secure a number of changes internally that students had been calling for. In turn, this led to securing a paid job at Rococo. And because I live in Sunderland, I've gone from being a trainee to becoming a training co-facilitator alongside my community organiser when needed and lending support to organisations in the Sunderland area where I can. Thank you Fiona. Your story mirrors uh, that of so many of us. Um, I myself have grown as a leader thanks to the opportunities that both my school and Telco have uh, afforded me. But now we will hear from Abdikai Farah who was already a leader of his organization when he became involved in Leicester Citizens. Abdi Kaif, over to you. Uh, thank you, Francis. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Abdi Kaif Farah from Leicester Somali Community Parents Association. I'm the CEO. So I often get approached by organizations that wanted to engage with our community, which is seen as a hard to reach. So when the local NHS trust got in contact last year. I decided to do things differently. And I built a team and we ran a listening campaign on the barriers that we face in accessing health services. Over 60 enthusiastic community members attended the meeting at our center with the NHS trustee who couldn't believe how engaged we were. As a result, we won a pledge from the chairman of the trustee, himself, Mr. Singh. The trust agreed to improve the translation of hospital signs and brochures into Somali and to help more Somali, Somalis access NHS uh, jobs. In fact, two community members went on to apply for jobs as a nurses thanks to the information and encouragement they received that day. Uh, the, training, uh, that, uh, the training on community organizing, which I attended in June 2019, gave me the tools to organize my community and to build effective relationships with local decision makers. I now put the training into practice whenever I can. Uh, for example, uh, during the lockdown, I recruited volunteers to run an ESOL classes for 41 of our Somali parents. Uh, they are doing this independently with little support from me. Uh, students are now registering into the more advanced ESOL courses run by local ESOL colleges. Before 
attending training. I would have struggled to recruit enough volunteers and build a team that works so well. It is rewarding to see what we are achieving now and all this, uh, the training and the access that I got and also my colleagues get has enabled us to do things differently and you know, make evaluation and do better outcome for our community activity and service. Thank you. Thank you, Abdi Kaif. That is an impressive story. As you can see, community organizing develops both new and established leaders alike. When senior leaders who are at the front for, uh, who are at the fr forefront of a sector adopt community organizing approaches, the potential for impact multiplies even further. So for our final reflection this morning, I'd like to invite Reverend Andy Griffiths to speak. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Andy and I'm Interim Director of Mission and Ministry for the Anglican Diocese of Chelmsford. Uh, so I went on the residential six-day training about three years ago and that gave me the ambition to ensure that all new ministers in the Church of England in East London and Essex um, got to see Christian leadership as community organizing. Um, that six day training, it was the most transformative, useful training I have had since the early 90s. And yes, I did train as a priest more recently than that. Um, I reckon that we can uh, use this uh, to make a real difference to the culture and direction of the diocese through some tools and through some principles. And specifically, what we're doing is restructuring our training program for new ministers. We call them curates and new licensed lay ministers. So that effectively, what they go through is an apprenticeship in community organizing. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that our trainees, and that's over a hundred people so far, have embraced this approach. And as a diocese, we've explicitly said, this is one of our strategic priorities. And I'm excited about this because it's not just about the Church of England in this area. There's a whole range of institutions across different sectors of civic society that are effectively putting community organizing approaches at the heart of their strategic visions. So for example, in my own alliance, which is Citizens Essex, I've seen the University of Essex introduce a bachelor's module on community organizing for its students. Out of an understanding that politics is best understood in practice, not just through studying it in a classroom. And many other universities such as Aston University are doing the same. And King's College London last year became the first UK university to embark on a whole university approach, embedding community organizing across departments as a way of rethinking how the university does public engagement. Across Citizens UK, there were trade unions and mosques and synagogues and temples and charities. And they're all finding ways to incorporate community organizing, not just as something that we do externally, but as something that enables all of our diverse institutions to become stronger. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing your experiences and your reflection. Um, it's been really brilliant to hear from so many of you. We're going to move into our next breakout room and Matthew, our Director of Citizens, is going to introduce that. Thank you, um, Salma. Yeah, just very quickly then. So we're going to break up into uh, breakouts. We'll have uh, 14 breakout rooms with seven or eight people in each. Um, this is where we really would value your uh, input, please. You'll be asked um, to record uh, on a Jamboard that will be explained or you can be helped with that. But we really want to know what has been most useful um, to you that you've heard and what more would you want from us or how can we share this 
uh, most usefully. Now we've got a range of people on the call, some from inside sort of citizens uh, alliances from different places, some from uh, different partner organizations and kind of why they're in the sector. And, you know, we really want to um, use this evaluation um, in the best way that we can. And we're kind of 75% uh, um, into having brought it together, but we really want to think about dissemination and where can we share it and what can be more useful. So, um, yeah, so we'll go into uh, the breakouts now, please. And thanks in advance for your input. We should all be more or less back now. Hopefully everyone's um, back. Uh, thank you all for your participation. We're nearly coming to a close. Um, your breakout, your input from the breakout room um, is really valuable to us. Um, so those of you who are leaders of Citizens UK, you can expect to join our Learning for Leaders webinars, which are going to be taking place on Thursday throughout the month of January which will share more learning and how to success successfully develop and run a Citizens Alliance. And to the many of you who've joined us from other organisations, thank you so much for taking an interest in community organising. We're definitely going to be following up with a copy of our research report and discuss how we can keep working together. Uh, coming to a close very soon. So before we finish, can I ask Matthew and then Dawn, um, just 30 seconds each, please, on your final remarks. Um, very, very quickly for me, just to say thank you so much um, to, to you, Salma and Francis, but to all the, the speakers that really brought this um, to life and to underline, yeah, we will send uh, a video recording of this and also I think what is about a 30 page um, summary of the evaluation so, so far, but we are interested in more ways to, um, to share this, particularly, you know, across the Citizens Network. Uh, but also beyond and we'll be looking at the jam boards thanks for filling those in for ideas of how to do that and and really it will be kind of through the spring that we'll continue to be uh, sharing this learning and yeah thanks again to the national lottery community fund for your support for uh, this growth project and this evaluation and to all the other partners on the call that are uh, working with us thank you uh, very much um, and uh, dawn did you want to say anything Final remarks, thanks also to recognise that uh, Dawn will be stepping down from the National Lottery Community Fund. So thanks particularly to you for your great leadership there over these last several years.